On today's show, the Dallas Mavericks are falling right now. How do they stop it? How do they get better on the court? We'll talk about all that and more and give real examples on today's Locked on Mavs. I'm Luka Doncic and this is Locked on Mavericks. Welcome to the Mavericks. NBA champions. I don't believe you shouldn't be here. Loyalty never fades away. And welcome. You are locked on to the Dallas Mavericks. My name is Nick Angstead, media member and NBA channel manager for the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thanks for being part of the show. We'll make it Locked On Mavs your first listen today. Well, the best way you can help us grow the show is to listen every day, leave a five-star review, like the video, and comment anything below. Let me know in the comment section what's one thing the Mavs need to change on the court. You can't say just fire, kid. You, you can't just, that can't be the only thing. We'll tell you why later. Today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, use the code Locked On for twenty dollars off your first purchase. And joining me from Valley Sports Southwest, uh, the pre, middle, and post game. That's <laughs> what you got for me, Dana Larson. Hey, Nick. I have an idea today. I have an idea today. I think that we should have like a bonding retreat for the Mavericks. <laughs> They need, I've got an itinerary plan. We're going to start with a room. sunrise hike. Yes, we'll hit the escape room, play some board games. Here's the key, some trust exercises. Oh, yeah. Right, right. And, and that's all they need. They just need a good day to bond together, get to know one another, and everything will be fine. Classic <laughs> problem with like less than 20 games left in the, <laughs> in the season for teams. Uh, today. Yesterday was a breaking point, I felt like. And I think that Jason Kidd's time with the Mavericks has probably come to an end. I think that he his his at least his vision or his message is not being met by the players, not being responded to because the same problems keep coming up over and over again. And so for the, all those of you that have said, Oh, kids, we gotta get rid of kid, I'm with you now. <laughs> I'm, I'm on that, I'm on that place now, me personally. The thing is, they're not going to get rid of him. It's too late in the season. They're not going to just remove a coach like that. And so today, Dana and I are going to focus on things on the court that the Mavericks can change and the things that they need to get better at. And as long as Jason Kidd is the coach, which I think he will continue to be until the end of the season, and then you can make a decision after that. As long as this is what the, the situation is. It's Jason Kidd as the coach. It's Luca Kyrie. It's, you know, P.J. Washington, Josh Green, Derek Lively, Gafford, Maxi. Everybody, as long as it's going to stay, that's going to be the same because that can't change now either. Trade deadline's done. Buyout guys, they don't have any more roster spots. It's all it's all in. This is it. What can they change and what can they get better at? Tangibly. <laughs> Tangibly. And I think we got to start, Dana, with the defensive effort. I think that's the first thing that has to change because this system does, as long as they're going to run that system, the Jason Kidd, Sean Sweeney, Going even back to Frank Vogel with the Lakers, like as long as you're going to run that system, it's dependent on effort and everybody's got to buy in on that end. And it honestly has to be the first, like the priority is that they buy in on that end first. Clearly. And I honestly, I don't know how you even quite explain why there isn't that 110% buy-in, you know, at this point. And you listen, I listen so closely to everything that the players and the coaches say and, and these are guys who I truly do believe take a lot of pride in what they do and, and are trying hard and are playing hard. And so when you've got, you know, people who uh, bright basketball minds that are out there saying that you're not giving enough, I have to listen. I have to believe that they can see that, that they're saying, you know, if you just put more in, if you leave skin on the floor, right. Um, with not more Jeff effort, Wade. not more, Jeff right? skin, Wade, but not, not, skin, not skin, skin Wade. That's right. Don't leave him on the floor. Um, <laughs> but spot. if you are, if you are doing that, so to me, I have to, I'm trying to think of, okay, so why is that not happening? And in my mind right now, it seems to me, cause a lot of the quotes coming out after the game are about communication and trust, right? Yeah. We keep hearing those two words over and over again. I feel like they're not getting it, right? They're not getting it. They're not, you hear, you also hear them say, if, if everybody is where they are supposed to be, we will be a good defensive team. So the problem is those five guys are not on the same page when they are out there. So first yeah. of all, figuring out why that is, right? And I know they're watching film endlessly and they're talking about and they're saying all the right things. 
to me, maybe at this point with 20 games to go, and yeah, I'm joking about a bonding retreat, you know, with only a quarter <laughs> of the season left. But the reality is they are almost in training camp mode right now because yeah. you've got two new guys at the trade deadline. You got Exum and Lively back about the same time. You have a fully healthy roster, which on the surface sounds great, but it has created actually some problems because they do not have uh, established roles. They do not feel like they have an established rotation yet. And to me, that's where the problems are happening. Um, Daniel Gafford said, if we mess up, then everybody panics. All eyes on me. Like that's the feeling they have when they're out there that everybody's looking at you and pointing fingers. You didn't get it right that you screwed up. And I'm just thinking in my head, there has to be a way to simplify the situation right now. When they got the two new guys, the first game out, remember how great that first game was the defensive effort against the Oklahoma city thunder was fantastic. Guess why? It was simple. You had two new guys. You were just going and playing read and react basketball, right? Then you spend a bunch of time teaching them the ways of the Dallas Mavericks and implementing <laughs> the, the system, right? Uh. And the strategies. Now it appears that there is there is too much breakdown and they just have to get to the heart of why that's happening. Maybe to tear down the walls of what the Dallas what the Dallas Mavericks are. Apparently, let's just go out there and roll out the ball. Sometimes it feels like that's what they do anyway. Go play ball, yeah, yeah, yeah. Th- this this whole thing is is so interesting with the defensive chemistry, the communication, and I, I agree with you. I think they got to go back to go back to day one. Go back to that training camp mode and over communicate. Right, like mm-hmm. do do more than what you think you actually have to do. There's there can be no more assumed knowledge. It's something that. You know, you and I t- talk about in our our industry is like, if somebody is listening to my show, I can't assume that they watched the game last night. I can't assume that they know every single thing that happens on Mavs Twitter because a ton of you that listen to the show aren't on Twitter at all, which is good for you. It's probably better yeah. for your probably <laughs> better for your men- mental health at that point. <laughs> and so, uh, don't assume that everybody knows it. Like you know, everybody knows exactly where they're supposed to be. And like have. Like the Gafford's quote is so interesting. The, you know, it seems like as soon as somebody messes up, there's always a pointing of fingers. It's, I think it starts from, from the top down. And I think Luca's got to take some of that leadership and Kyrie's got to take some of that leadership. And like, he, I think he does a good job on offense. When somebody misses a three, Mm -hmm. he claps in the face, like, keep going, keep going. Exum missed missed the air ball of three the other game. And he's like, no, keep going, keep going. Mm -hmm. It's got to be the same thing on defense. They've got to put the same level of intention on it. And it's not about whose fault it was. It's about how we can get better going forward and how we can take that next step. Um, yeah. And so the defensive effort has just got to get better. And I think it's about communicating. It's about maybe they need to do a trust fall. Maybe they need to do a trust <laughs> exercise. Like, and just somehow they have to prove to each other that we're in this together as a team and not just like me. <laughs> like it's, it's a weird thing that they have True. to do as a professional And they're, they're of kind of two minds right now, in my opinion, the needing to be patient side and the intense sense of urgency you should have at this point in the season. And they're, they cannot quite figure out how to balance those two. Right. And maybe, maybe it is simply every single day before a game, you talk about what's at stake. And you start really putting it out there. You know how for a lot of the year, I'm not looking at the standings. It's not worth looking at the standings. We're looking at what's happening right in here, uh, in these walls, within this team. Maybe this is the time where you start creating some sort of um, exercises where you can appreciate what's at stake if that's what it takes to get you motivated and get you to play at that kind of level and that kind of urgency. Because that's the sort of energy and effort you have to play with on the defensive end. Coming up, is there lineup things they should change? Should they lean into the centers? We'll talk about that and more coming up. Today's episode is brought to you by Nissan. Are you the kind of driver that likes to push things a little bit further? You want to not just make the play-in, but actually make the playoffs. Ever wonder what adventure could be like around the corner? Our friends at Nissan have a lineup of SUVs with the capabilities to take your adventure to the next level. They've got the Nissan Rogue. The 2024 Nissan Rogue is a perfect car for city drives and great escapes. You've got that Google built in, so you always have that assistant that you can you know, call up for Google Assistant, Google Maps, Google Play Store, all that kind of stuff on the 12.3 inch HD touchscreen infotainment system. It's not just info, it's not just entertainment, it's both. 
2024 Nissan Rogue is the perfect mid-size crossover for your next adventure. Compare that to the 2024 Nissan Armada. It will change what you expect from a full-size SUV. Picture a rugged 4x4. They'll seat up to eight in first-class luxury and style. Tow bigger and explore further in the 2024 Armada. Take the Nissan Rogue, the Pathfinder, or the Armada and go on your next big adventure at shopnissan or shopnissan.com, nissanusa.com. Check it out. Shut it down! Oh, Let's go! Thanks, everybody, for hanging out with us on Lockdown Maps, being part of the show, part of the Raccoon Squad, listening every day. We appreciate each and every one of you. And uh, go check out the 2020, or the, the 24-7, 2020, 24-7, Lockdown Sports Dallas stream. You've got shows covering the Mavs, the Rangers, the Cowboys. Rangers starting up again. Cowboys always doing something interesting. Uh, Aggies. We've got Longhorns. We've got all kinds of stuff on that. So the Lockdown Sports Dallas YouTube channel as well as Amazon Fire TV. All right, Dana. What's another thing the Mavs can do on the court and need to get better at on the court? Okay. How about getting some help for Luca in the first half of games? I mean, we we're, we're continuing to see Luca have these unbelievable first halves, right? He's got 25 point half almost night in and night out. They've trailed at half in seven straight games where he has done the majority of the work. I, I, and, and I don't know if it's, you know, Kyrie is so smart about picking his spots and the time in games to really start cooking, um, and we're desperately looking for this third score to really, you know, emerge and take hold. Um, so I don't know exactly. I don't have any, have the fixes here. I'm certainly <laughs> not a, a coach at all. It's in observations when you can look at a team and realize that uh, Milo doesn't like the fact that they're always trailing at half. <laughs> My dog last then, week, your dog this week. <laughs> <laughs> and then you're uh, forced to come out in the second half and they haven't had the right kind of focus, uh, you know, in those third quarters and they've, they found themselves really struggling there. To me, that's, that's one thing that they could, could try to focus on is getting some other guys in a rhythm earlier in the game. Yeah. This is something I noticed last night in the, the Pacers game is that Luca took 30 shots and it was one of the first games where, and I've, I've defended Luca so much and his style and his, you know, uh, I, the Mavs best offensive play is still a Luka Doncic isolation play mm. just is like efficiency wise. I've defended that, but I think there are some like, it, like your, your return on investment and in some of that stuff can come back to bite you because it doesn't get other people involved as much. And so I think there's gotta be a little bit more, like so there's a little, just a little more share the ball because it doesn't help you later in the game. Luca can always turn that on. Mm -hmm. We don't have Luca doesn't have to get in rhythm. He doesn't have to like the, he doesn't have to take all these shots to get in rhythm and, and and do all that. Maybe take here. I'll take I'll take yours a step further. Luca's got to stop. Here we go. <laughs> here we go. He's got to stop J spending the first three to four minutes of the game seeing if he's gonna get the body bump fouls. He spends mm. the first, the beginning of every single game, like, all right, am I going to get this foul today? He drives to the rim. He can get there any single time he wants. He can get, he gets to the rim, see if he's going to get that body bump foul. And then he complains if he doesn't get it. And then if he does get it, and then he's excited and, and all that. And then you just keep spamming that over and over and over and over and over and over again. <laughs> I think they've got to get away from that because it's all just, it's all just Luca. And it's got to be more about the rest of the team and all that. And I think that's just one little small change I think they, they can make to set the tone because it is about setting tone. And this team does hang their head when they don't get the ball on offense or they don't hit their threes or the fouls aren't coming for them. And so just avoid that. Right. Avoid, avoid that whole thing. Avoid the whole thing of, oh, uh, we're not getting the foul calls. Okay, well, they don't, don't intentionally hunt them at the beginning of games to try and set that tone at the beginning. And I think if you start that on offense, Jason Kidd has said a million times this season, no one's dying. No, not that. He's he said a million <laughs> times this season that our offense is our defense. And so, you know, start with the off start with the offensive end and set a tone there. I'm actually I keep remembering now because it was such a great memory, the the Thunder win, right? Right after the trade. And and what did Luca do in that game? He fed the two new guys yeah. at the rim, which felt very intentional. And what an incredible tone that set, not only for them, but in the building and for the rest of the game. And we saw we saw him do that with Gafford last night in the second half in the game against the Pacers and really got going in yeah. the second half. And look at the energy it brought. It was 
it was the, the absolute bright spot of that second half, but it was too little too late in that game. They were already down by 18 or whatever it was. Um, so he, maybe those are some of the plays too, that you could, you could see them sort of prioritize a little bit more early on. Yeah. And it's, it's, it is about, it's just about setting a tone. It's, Hey, I'm going to feed this guy. You saw with lively at the beginning of the season. I thought Luca mm -hmm. was like intentionally trying to feed him and like, all right. And then as soon as he kind of understands the player, then he doesn't need to go to that. And he doesn't need to intentionally feed that player. But I think that's how you have to get those guys involved. The Mavs have, have surrounded Luca and Kyrie with a bunch of finishers that finish plays. And so now you have to set them up. And I think, it, I think setting that tone early in a game, I think could change the, those, the role players mentality about mm. defense. And that's maybe what's, that's maybe what kickstarts them to be a better defensive team. Yeah. They don't mind doing the dirty work. They love that. Right. They get, that's part of what they do, but there's a reason there is the saying, which is, you know, you got to throw the dog a bone sometimes too. Right. Because it is something that can get their, their juices flowing early in a game. And it definitely can feed over to the offensive rebounding, helping with second chance shots, rim protection, running the floor, all of it sort of, you know, feeds off of, you know, the excitement of some of those early buckets. No, I, th I think I've, I've complained about Jason Kidd. I have said that I don't think he should be the coach anymore. I've done all these things. I think for the most part, he's played the right rotations. I think that there are a couple things here and there that I could maybe that you could tweak, but it's always after the fact where I go, oh, I should have played this guy instead. I think for the most part, he's done the right things. He played Gafford at the end of the Pacers game when he was giving him a spark. You know, he sat Tim Hardaway. His minutes keep going down because he's not playing very well at all. One thing, though, that I think that they need to lean into more is the centers because now you, you're a big, you can be a big team now. Lean into that a little bit more. And maybe you have to adjust some of your, your defense. Maybe you have to play drop a little bit more than you want to. Maybe you have to, you know, not be uh, so beholden to your switch everything and, like, uh, you know, switch mm -hmm. and recover and all that stuff. Defense, like maybe you have to change some of that a little bit, but they've, they're a bigger team now and they don't have to play like this small team. And I feel like they hamstring themselves. A, is that the right word? Hamstrung? Is it hamstrung? Hamstring? They at times have hamstrung themselves. You have, have to really work with that one. They have, they have <laughs> limited themselves by playing small all the time and playing the other team's game. And that's what they did against the Pacers was they're just, all right, we'll just play your game. We'll play small and we'll try to play fast. And that's not what, the, that's not what they do. And then they just completely got caught up in it. And I think playing a little bit bigger and slowing it down, maybe a, a little more P push the pace when you get stops, but like play your game a little bit more and let teams kind of come to you sometimes. I, I agree with that a hundred percent. I like, you know, you can start out a season having a feel for who you want to be. But as your team changes and evolves, and it has, sometimes you just have to play to the, the players you have and the strengths that they bring to the court. I was a little surprised to see that they were, again, going to sort of outpace or to attempt to outpace the Pacers yeah. to, to keep up with a team that, you know, will blow anyone out of the water in terms of scoring and pace. Um, after it happened, uh, you know, in the first game and the Mavs were unsuccessful, I thought there might be a little bit of an attempt to slow it down and, and take away some of those possessions and give yourself a better chance to take care of the ball and not turn it over and, and feed into what they do well. Um, I did like that he did go to Gafford a little bit more, though, and I yeah. thought that might be a little bit of um, an eye-opening moment where we're starting to see, to your point, maybe that will be something they do going forward. And, and Gafford, the good news was he stepped right in uh, and stepped up. And so he certainly gave them plenty to think about in terms of doing that. Absolutely. Coming up, let's talk about some other changes we think that the Mavericks should make. Let's talk about Kyrie, because I think you talked about him picking his spots early. And let's talk about his role in all of this. Let's talk about that coming up. Today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app today, and you can get tickets for any concert or show or sporting event or anything that you want. They've got tons of stuff in the DFW area. If you're looking right now, uh, I'm on, they've got Texas Rangers tickets already March 31st on Sunday, 30 bucks globe white field. You can go check out a, a midday Sunday game. That sounds super fun. Uh, cat Williams coming to, uh, coming to a theater near you. Maybe he'll say something insane. <laughs> Maybe he'll say something else <laughs> insane and get spilled tea on somebody else. 21 Savage is coming. Billy Joel is coming. All kinds of stuff. You can check out at gametime.co or download the game time app. Create an account, use that code locked on to get $20 off your first purchase on any tickets to a sporting event, comedy, concert, all that stuff. Terms apply. Again, create an account, redeem that code locked on for $20 off. Download the Game Time app today. 
Last minute tickets, lowest prices, guaranteed. Shut it down! Oh, Let's go home! Thanks, everybody, for hanging out with us on Lockdown Mavs. Being part of this show, we appreciate you and every one of you. All right, Dana. Let's talk about some more things the Mavs need to do. We talked about them leaning into the centers a little bit more. And I think that the Mavs need to do that a little bit, bit more and figure out how to... Uh, play bigger and to to be the imposer, be the team that, that wins the rebounding battle, which is just not a thing that they've been for a long time. Win on win on just spamming a pick and roll all the time. And if you can find a way to just keep scoring and scoring and scoring on that, then bet on the other team missing their three point shots for once instead of the Mavs just like mm-hmm. living and dying by the three, which they haven't lived lived and died by the three as as much since the trades. And I think that's that's been a that's been mm-hmm. one like positive in, in their wins that it doesn't it isn't their wins haven't come just because they've won the three point battle. For sure. I agree with that. Um, and and I, I think that's, you know, to your point, you score 120. It's not the offense. I mean, not yeah, to circle back right. to how we started the show, but it, I, I think offensively they have everything they need um, and they do on a nightly basis. It is just set a goal to just hold teams under 30 in a quarter and you're probably <laughs> going to win more games and you're going to lose at this point. So, um, yes, I think you're right. That is nice to see that there's more balance to the way they play um, and you aren't just, you know, sort of terrified night in and night out if, you know, if it's going to come down to Tim Hardaway Jr. being able to to shoot the three or not. And and he's a real interesting study. I mean, yeah. we're at, you know, such an interesting point with him. It's either play him way less at this stage or I, I could even has. argue or I could even argue play him more because Whoa. if you really want him to provide you with his shot making, which is what he does. He is not great out there with 12 minutes and getting a few shots in one quarter and a few three quarters later. That does not, to me, that is not how you're going to get the best out of Tim Hardaway Jr. So you have to figure out, they say we want him to put him in positions to succeed. I know you have to look at whether what he what he does defensively is, you know, a bad enough situation to not play him at all. I think that that is, they need to figure that out right now because you're trying to play a lot of guys and you either need to really tighten up this rotation, almost start looking at it like we need to get to where we're in playoff mode. Um, So everybody knows what minutes they're going to get, what role they're going to play, who they're on the court with. Um, There needs to be some of that, I think, happening pretty soon here. And Tim Hardaway Jr. is a big question mark and how they want to do that. Huge question mark. I cannot get on board with playing him more. And I, think, I know you can't. I, I think I, I think I would lean into. I think I would lean into the not, not play him at all because someone asked me this question last night, and it, sometimes someone asks you a question, and you go, "Oh my god!" <laughs> it's like, it just makes you realize. They said, "What's the difference between what Christian Wood was doing last year and what Tim Hardaway Jr. is doing this year?" And I couldn't come up with a good answer for it. It because. We talked about how one weak link in the Mavs defense can really break the bunch, you know, and then they, then you start pointing fingers mm, and the stuff that we talked about right. at the beginning. And Tim is at that point right now where even if he, he, he bought in on, on offense and he got the shots that he wanted, like you're talking about, he just doesn't give you anything on the other end. And that's the, air, the end of the floor that you desperately need. They played him, what, un, just under 13 minutes last night still still scored 120 points like they can still do that they have ways to do it now he's not giving you anything on the other end and so i don't know that well there's (laughs) tough that's why you're a coach that's why it's a hard job and that's why you get paid a lot of money you might have to have those sort of decisions extremely difficult decisions be made and hard conversations had and i think we're at the precipice of of it going one way or the other yeah i think i think more Derek Jones Jr., less Tim Hardaway Jr. Like lean it like one junior instead of the other. I think that's <laughs> I think that's the if you're going to come up with some kind of what should they do on the court, I think that's one of the things. I do want to talk about Kyrie though. What do you think Kyrie's role is in some of this? We talked about his offense and picking his spots. He's still taking like 20 shots a game. He's he's get, still getting the volume, not getting the free throw line at all, but that's kind of been a staple of his of his game. What do you think his role is in this this next stretch of the season? 
Well, and it, it feels like, too, they're looking to him to really stabilize that locker room right now. Yeah. Uh, Kyrie and Markeith Morris, apparently, are the voices of reason. And uh, Ooh, the, boy. the people who are keeping things Ooh, calm boy. amidst the panic that may be happening on the outside. I have a feeling he's telling everybody. Just sent me with that one. the noise, right? I mean, if anyone knows how to block out noise, it's got to be Kyrie Irving. That's and very true. I, and so I, not only, you know, he, he's going to give you 20 plus on a nightly basis. It does seem to be interesting that, yeah, I love to say, and he truly does know how to pick his spots. And I would want him to shoot every shot in every fourth quarter. I know he has that in his DNA. I'm not exactly sure why it feels like he is struggling to find his offensive rhythm in the first half. Um, he'll, he's having a lot of three for 10 kind of first yeah. halves. Um, that seems surprising. And and I think it, it, my frustration is that he doesn't get those foul calls. Mm. A lot of that is him, those brilliant drives to the rim. And he's such a good finisher, but I do believe he gets banged up in there and then comes away with nothing for it. He does. He's not able to finish in those moments and doesn't go to the free throw line. And then as the game goes along, he's his jump shot starts to come around or he, he starts to figure out how, um, you know, to find those mid range shots that are open for him. So I don't know if it, I guess offensively what he can do differently, but I do know that he's the leader. I think that will need to kind of keep this thing together. Yeah. I think he may need to take a step forward on the defensive end as more of, as more of a vocal leader. Cause he's got, he's got to know, he's got to know what, mm-hmm. what, what's going on and what the, what the problems are and speak to it. And like, Call it out. You've been on this team now for a year and a half. It's longer than a lot of players on this team actually now at this point, which is wild. That's something that I just recently looked up. You know how many games Luca and Kyrie have played together so far? This season? All all time. Going back to last season even. Oh, I should know this. Uh, No, you shouldn't because it surprised me. Okay. All right. Go ahead. 51 games. 51. Okay. 51 feels, so far. It's actually but, more. Are you surprised? More than you that, thought? Yeah. I, I, I feel like that might actually feel like more than I thought. I think if I, if I really thought through all the injuries and all that, yeah, it'd probably yeah. be more than I would think. But, but just hearing that number, they've played a, a season and a half together and you know, they played 35 games this season so far and 16 last season. It's just, it's just not a lot of games. No. And so they really haven't played a, like that much together, but I think you're getting to the point now where, I think somebody's got to get through to Luca in some ways in some of the things that we talked about earlier, complaining to the refs. I think that has like the returns on that are just, I think they're, they're hurting the Mavs. And I think Negative, that, yes. I think that may be one of the things that's hurting Kyrie and him not getting calls at the, like at the rim and anything like that. And so maybe it's Kyrie stepping in because it, the message from Jason Kidd is not coming through. And so maybe it's Kyrie is the one that has to come in and say, Listen, Luca. Like we've got to stop this. Like it's just not helping us at all. Honestly, if Luca just stopped mm-hmm. cold turkey completely and didn't do it, I think it would be the same result as it is right now. Because I don't think it's helping them anymore. Right. You have two of the most, you know, uh, brilliant offensive players in the yes. game, and most likely internally, they feel like, do we really have to do it all? Right. Like we're already doing so much for this team. And now I have to be really great on the defensive end too. And you could almost appreciate if that is in their minds. I mean, I get that, right? You want to build a team that, you know, could kind of allow them to expend all their energy just offensively where they're so great. That's not the reality. That is truly not the reality. And especially with the position they play, they do need to be a part of that point of attack defense against some of the other most dynamic scorers in the game. So uh, we know and that when we see Luca do it, he gets steals, he'll block a shot. Yeah. You know, he gets in the way. Um, it, it does. He, he then leads by example and everybody follows in line and follows suit. So, but it is exhausting. I can only imagine to play at that level on both ends. And we've reached sort of, we're even beyond the dog days. And there was very little break for Luca over the all-star break. It is asking a ton, but yet it is what has to be done. And I don't even think Luca's defense has been the biggest problem, right? Like right. I wouldn't, I wouldn't put that as one of the top things. Like, oh, defensive effort. Luca's not putting in the. I don't. He he has been this yeah. season, 
and he's been better and all that. And Kyrie too. Agree. Agree. But this is, yeah, this is now their team. They have to ha- step out there and show that they're not just superstars in, in name. They are going to be, you know, the, the leaders to kind of pull them through some tough times, get them over the hump and just get into the playoffs, you know, with some good momentum. It's put up or shut up time. There's, right. <laughs> the Mavs are trending down. These are things that we think that they can, could help them to trend back up. And now we've got, you know, you've got the the Heat. Oh, another another excellent coaching matchup for the Mavericks yeah. on Thursday is the, the Heat coming into town. Mm. You've got the Pistons on Saturday, maybe a get-right game. The Bulls on Monday, uh, and then the Warriors next Wednesday, and then Thunder. That Warriors-Thunder back-to-back is like, oof. That is like, I know. Denver not far down the road either on the schedule. We talked about this last time I was on the pod, that the schedule was unkind coming up, and it was going to be unforgiving. Yeah. If you were not ready for it, and if you are in the midst of any sort of, um, you know, developing who you are as an identity here with this new group, you are going to be taken advantage of. And uh, they have obviously had to learn some hard lessons and had some humbling games through this stretch. And maybe, maybe they can, if they can just survive it. The weird thing is, you win seven in a row, right? Yeah. And then you lose five of six. So you do the math. What is that? 13 games, you're eight and five. All right. That's above 500 in that stretch. If you were just looking at it from, you know, a, a big picture view, you'd say that's not bad. We probably would have taken that looking at the teams you're playing, but it was from one extreme to the other. And it was from a defensive rating that was the best in the NBA at the time <laughs> to now the worst. And so that, I think, is what's been hard to kind of process. Before the seven-game win streak, they went two and six. Mm-hmm. Before that, they went uh, they went five and two. <laughs> Before that, they went three and one. It's like it's just the highs they, and the lows. The highs and the lows. And I, and I think that's where I come back to coaching. It, it just can't stabilize. You know, it just can't be – you know, stable down the middle. It has to be these insane highs and these insane lows. And so some of these things could, could help change it. Uh, we'll be back tomorrow slightly. I think, I think slightly will be back. He has sworn <laughs> off the Mavericks. And so I may be going oh, solo no. on, on Thursday. So we'll, we'll see the, the state of slightly biased after that, but uh, we'll still have a podcast no matter what. So check back in guys. Thanks for listening to locked on Mavs. Peace out. Boom.